Hey guys, welcome. Welcome guys. Homie don't play that, homie. You don't know me. What's up, David? Watan? Wutan. There's a lot of brothers here. Dave Wutan, did you watch last night's? Yeah, you just uh, you said you missed it. Good one, brother. You got to watch last night's session, David Wutan, because you may get troubled because you kept asking me about the new King James Version. You may be troubled after you watch it. Anyway, what's up? Thank you. Someone call me handsome. Now, remember, where I'm at, it's 10 in the morning. So that's why my eyes look kind of, you know. Our brother is running a few minutes late. Let me see. Yeah, over Father's Holy Spirit. Yeah, he'll let me know. Yeah, my poor sister. She's telling me she's struggling with Galatians 1.19. Sonia, if she's here, uh, let's begin in prayer. We're waiting. He'll let me know. And Smokey, good to see you guys. If you don't know Smokey Saint is cool. Smokey Saint, cool. I, no, his name is Smokey Saint. Help me, my God. Yeah, all the thoughts is great. Subscribe to his YouTube channel, Smokey Saint. God has blessed him. <clears throat> He's doing apologetics, especially refuting atheism. Pray the Lord Jesus bless that young man because, like I've said, we want more lions, lionesses on fire for Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, to be doing ministry and outreach and starting YouTube channels and websites refuting all these worldviews and conflict with Christianity. And he <clears throat> has been led by the Lord to refute atheism and atheist agnostic attacks against the Christian faith, especially the arguments of Bart Ehrman against the Christian faith. So pray for him. Help, help him <clears throat> to build up his YouTube channel. Help him to go viral because we need more lions and lionesses in the field. It's not about competition. It's about working together by the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, we praise you. We love you. We worship you. We praise. We love. We worship your son, the Lord Jesus. And we praise and we love and worship your Holy Spirit. We first love you for who you are. You are God. That alone makes you worthy of love and praise and honor. And as our God... <clears throat> All life, everything good, all provisions are from you. And so we love you and praise you for your provision. And we also love you and praise you for the salvation you've given us in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we love and praise you for your word, the Holy Bible, your perfect words preserved perfectly. The Bible being your word is your voice to your children. The voice of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, to his bride. The voice of the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies the bride of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask for illumination. Empower us by your Spirit to understand your word, <clears throat> to absorb your word, to eat your word, to live out your word, proclaim your word, to love your word, and even die for your word if necessary. Because the Bible being your word is your voice. And enslave us to your voice, to be in love with your voice, your voice alone, the voice of your son, the voice of your spirit. And Father, I ask that you bless this young man who's about to join me. Help me not to give out his name. Anoint him to present the facts clearly without error, not to misrepresent seven-day Adventism. And Father, strengthen him and strengthen me and strengthen your children. Fill us with your spirit, with your presence. Cover us in the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus. And shield them. Shield us and our loved ones. And seal us in your love, the love of Jesus and the love of your spirit. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat <clears throat> and my heart with the breath of life, the health I need to use it to glorify you. Strengthen my voice and bless the sound of my voice and the voice of my brother in Jesus to be pleasing to your children and guide us into all truth and protect us from Satan and his children and bless this session for the glory of Jesus. May he increase in us. May we decrease. We love you, Abba. We love you, Babi. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> We're going to wait a few minutes for him to show up. Now, folks, I know this... At this time, it's early morning where I'm at. It's 1 p.m. in New York, in Michigan. I know in the U.K. it's around, what, 
maybe 7, 8 p.m. Some places it's getting dark now. Lord willing, Lord Jesus willing, I will be back on if God wills. I know it's going to be late for many of you, but it'll be archived. Lord Jesus willing, I'll be back on today around 6.30 p.m. market, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, Lord Jesus willing, to talk about Israel and the church because I didn't get to talk about it yesterday. So for those of you who will be asleep, the Lord bless you and refresh you. When you wake up, you can watch the, the live stream archived on my YouTube channel. So mark it, let people know to be here at 6.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If the Lord wills, I'll be back <clears throat> at that time. So God willing. Now we're just waiting for this brother to show up. <clears throat> I forgot to email some folks. It's okay. Now, <clears throat> he said he'd be a little late, about 20 minutes later than the scheduled time. So I have a few minutes to share. And I just want to share with Sonia. God willing, Sonia, not this week, sometime next week, I'm bringing William Albrecht on. He's going to be signing the church fathers. He's going to be showing from the statements and the writings of the church fathers in the second century, third century, fourth century, that the unanimous position of the church was that the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, remained a virgin even after giving birth to the Lord Jesus. She remained a virgin until the Lord Jesus took her home. So when he makes that case historically, what I'm going to do the very next day, God willing, I want you guys to pay attention. The next day after he makes this case, this historical case, I will come back and make a case refuting my own objections, objections that I learned over the years, <clears throat> refuting my own objections from the scriptures that Mary had children after she gave birth to the Lord Jesus as a virgin. And I'm going to show you what those passages must mean, must mean if God, who is sovereign over creation, sovereign over the church, is guiding the church in such a way not to contradict the Bible, <clears throat> but to correctly interpret the Bible because the Lord God and his goodness and his faithfulness to his word and his church will not allow the church universally. I'm not talking about a small pocket here, a small pocket there. The church universal, universally, especially when it's unit, in, in union, when there's unity, to hold to beliefs that are directly in contradiction to the Bible. I cannot believe that. So I'll explain what it means for James to be called the Lord's brother. The Lord's brother <clears throat> would not necessarily mean brother from the same mother. Brother would mean his blood relative and brother would have to refer to the fact that he's not a brother from the same mother, but he's called brother because that was <clears throat> the title given to him growing up with Jesus because he was a blood relative. And because they were blood relatives, they were called his brothers in that sense. So Lord willing. And I'll explain why I had to change my position. Lord Jesus willing in due course. Now, guys, pray up. He's ready. Yes, like cousin. Exactly, Basinath. He's ready. He just contacted me. Let's go in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, bless this man. Save him from error and be glorified. How you doing, my friend? Hi, Sam. Good morning. How are you? To me, it's morning. And by the way, before I move on. Someone I had to block, they're saying, hmm, kind of fishy. He doesn't want to be seen, and he doesn't want people to know his name. Maybe it's a hoax. So people are starting to attack you already. Well, actually, it's just, uh, <clears throat> you know, because uh, I am uh, more or less, I mean, I'm an artist, and I am uh, more or less like a public figure. Uh, and I, uh, I, 
I, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, draw too much attention um, to myself. Mm. It's, uh, it's. I mean, these people who, who tell this, they can call me and uh, yes. um, they can uh, write to me. No problem for me. I, I don't have any problems All right. with, uh, with uh, actually saying who I am. Yeah. By the way, folks, can you hear his voice? Is it good? Is it good enough where you can hear it? before he begins the session. I just want to make sure, because this is for your benefit. He's doing this. Let me just remind you how this happened. He was praying the Lord Jesus would put in my heart to start dealing with Seventh-day Adventism. Now, before listening to this young man and then doing some research confirming what he said is spot on, I had assumed that Seventh-day Adventism, because it professed worship and love of the Triune God, could still be considered Christians, even though they mistakenly follow Ellen G. White. Because of this young man, I no longer hold that position. And I'm going to say it. <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventism, this movement is a cult. Ellen G. White is a false prophetess, and you must abandon this movement and repent. And he's going to show you why. And so now how, notice how God works. When I started talking about it, he reached out and said that God... <clears throat> He's praying that God would have me talk about it. And now the Lord brought him into our lives to show us his research. He's going to be giving you the references, quoting from Ellen G. White. He sent me a, an email with, with all those citations. God willing, I'll try to make it available. But I want you to hear this man out. And by the way, it's probably good he's not showing his face. He's a handsome young man. Now, brother, you are in love with Jesus Christ, right? Absolutely. So I'm going to encourage you, and I know you do. You are someone who sold out for Jesus because I'm glad you're not showing your face because then you're going to give me competition. No sister will ever consider marrying me because of you. But no, <laughs> he's a, I'm telling you guys, the guy's such a handsome young man. He can be a model, but he's using his beauty for the beauty of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus Christ. When he smiles, his teeth shine. He can do Colgate commercials, man. <laughs> Why, brother? Why are you, what is it? Is your father was your father handsome and your mother a model? Is that how you turn out to be so such a handsome young man? What happened? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I I don't know. I, I really uh, like. See, I made I, him turn blush. I, I made him blush. I don't I don't know what to tell you, Sam. It's like it's uh it's uh, it's not important. It's not hey important. man, well it's I'm important just, to me because I'm starting I to hate just you. brushed my teeth, you know. I just brushed my teeth regularly and uh, that's all I did. <laughs> Friend, I've been brushing my teeth for years and I still got coffee stained teeth and I'm starting to hate you because I'm envying you, bro. All right. But anyway, well, crazy, maybe crazy. maybe it's because maybe it's because um, uh, my uh, uh, in Seventh Day Adventism drinking coffee is forbidden. Darn it. Why couldn't I have been a seven-day Adventist growing up and then later leave the movement? Darn it. Yeah, it. exactly. So they don't drink coffee, <laughs> exactly. really? Uh, yes, really. Um, it's uh, prohibited to drink anything that pushes you. Like, wow. for example, um, uh, alcohol definitely is forbidden. Then um, uh, uh, black tea is forbidden. Green tea is forbidden. Coffee is forbidden. Uh, Coca-Cola is forbidden because it has uh, caffeine inside. So all these things are forbidden by Ellen. Is it is it coincidental that she forbade caffeine basically, just like Mormons do? When I don't think so. <laughs> because this what a reason why I said it. It's, it's not a coincidence, obviously. Because Mormonism, Adventism, started around the same century, 19th century. The 19th century became a hotbed of all these false heretical groups and cult leaders like Joseph Smith. Now, with that said, brother, the Lord Jesus, take over your mouth. Begin where you want to begin. I'm just going to get my coffee. Start speaking. You're going to expose Ellen G. White so that no one has any doubts. She's a false prophetess, not an instrument of God. This, that's my understanding, correct? Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, last time when we right. ended our conversation, you said, um, "Can you find me some false prophecies?" Yes. And uh, and uh, and I said, "Sure, I can find it." But uh, be before before we we get to that, first of all, I wanted to uh, tell you that the main evidence that's for, for me that she is a false prophetess is simply her untruthful statements about Jesus, Amen. his nature. And how we are saved, Amen. and and that's 
and that's what I would like to focus on in this Please. session. Go uh, ahead. Well, I mean, and, I mean, besides that, uh, there are false prophecies, and everybody can uh, check that out. Uh, like, uh, let's say, number one, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. Secondly, that Turkey would fall on August 11th, 1840. Uh, thirdly, that God told Ellen White that individuals attending the conference at Battle Creek on May 27th, 1856 would still be alive at Christ's second coming. That's what I mentioned already last in the last session. Yes. And uh, I can actually uh, give you the quote because I, I found it. Uh, well, look, point, what you can do, brother, Croatia. focus on whatever you want to focus. Focus on what she said about Jesus. And about salvation, yeah. and you can come back again and talk about false prophecies. Now, as you heard the brother, yeah, yeah, yeah. she's on record prophesying, and these prophecies failed miserably, exposing her as a false prophetess. But right now, which is more important, and I love this brother's heart, the most important thing is, what did she say about Jesus and salvation? So, brother, the, the floor is yours. I'll only stop you to repeat a point or to clarify a point. Guys, listen attentively. He's a godsend. So, go ahead, brother, begin. So first of all, I would like to I would like to actually start with uh, with uh, the investigative judgment, and because this doctrine is actually filled with with stuff that is that are heretical and uh, everything that is said about Jesus uh, within the context of of the investigative judgment, and I'd like to and I like to start with 1844 and uh, give you a quote that um, last time I, I, I didn't give you, and it's uh, the following, that uh, it says, the judgment of the dead began in 1844. When that work shall be completed, judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. So on 1844, this is the ad additional information that I would like to add, is that Jesus began the investigative judgment on October 22nd in 1844, and he started the judgment with the dead. And when he finishes, like with all the people that lived before us, right? Every single person, every single person, he started with the investigative judgment uh, uh, of the dead. And when he is finished with the dead, he's going to continue uh, with the living. And, and where did she say this, brother? Before, I, I don't mean to cut you off. Where was this stated? Where did she say this? The source again? Just curious. Selected, selected messages. Hmm. Uh, one, one twenty-five. Okay, so listen. He's going to give you the reference. Selected messages, one twenty-five. The investigative judgment. No, no, no. Selected messages one. Okay. And then you have double point oh, one twenty-five. I'm sorry. Remember, we're not used to the chapter and versification of the sources. So we want to document it because I've had Adventists come in and question you and saying, especially since you haven't been baptized, what what right do you have to criticize? Because you're simply quoting the sources. So it's selected messages, one and then 25. You'll find it. So that's, I assume, message one and paragraph or section 25 or page 25. Yes, so the exactly. investigative judgment began October 1844. Exactly. Okay, go the ahead. Investigative judgment began October 24 with the uh, October 1844 with the death. And nobody knows, and that's a quote from the Great Controversy on page 490. She says, soon, no one, no one knows how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. So nobody knows when Jesus Christ will pass on to the cases of the living. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the first thing that I will, uh, wanted to just to add for clarification that uh, the investigative judgment started uh, on uh, a, in 1844, beginning with the dead, and then I would like to move on to the set to the next point where she actually you can you can conclude that from the statements that Christ is defiling heaven with his blood. Wow. So, yes. Uh, so this is this is a. I'll give you. I'll give you like a, a two quotes for that. Uh, this is the Great Controversy, page four hundred and twenty-one. It says, "As H, as anciently the sins of the people were by faith placed upon the sin offering, 
and through its blood transferred in figure to the earthly sanctuary, so in the new covenant, the sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ and transferred in fact to the heavenly sanctuary. So basically, Jesus is uh, transferring with his blood. We, we, uh, we place our sins by faith upon Christ, and then he is transferring that blood unto heaven. So he's basically defiling heaven with his blood. So that's what this and, says. Uh, Just to make sure you didn't twist the words. It says Christ is defiling, defiling heaven with his blood. Exactly. And just so because, again, we you just shocked every one of us that someone to speak about the blood of Christ that way. That's what it actually states. Christ defiling heaven with his blood. Uh, excuse me. That's not the, that's not, uh, oh, oh, uh, that's not the, um, how do you say, uh, I'm missing the word. Um, um, uh, that's, uh, that's not, um, that's not what it, what it literally says, but uh, you can you can conclude that oh, uh, what okay. it literally says yes. is that is that is that uh, the sins are placed upon Christ and his blood uh, uh, by his blood he's transferring uh, our sins to the heavenly sanctuary so basically he's he's contaminating okay heaven let me with our blood that is loaded with our uh, no with his blood that is loaded with our sins okay I just want to because I always want to make sure we distinguish how we interpret something with, with her actual words. So I just want to make sure you're interpreting what she's saying as that the blood of Jesus must be defiled because his blood contains our sins in his blood. But yes. Because I, I mean, just want to make sure. And, and I'm not trying to stop yeah. you because I want to just be accurate because I don't want people to think we're lying and twisting. So she yes. did not say Christ is defiling heaven with his blood that's no no okay no, no. okay no, no no that's not what she said okay. but uh, factually it is what it is I see. Uh, because because uh, you know uh, the the sins are placed by faith upon christ's blood and then this is being transferred uh into the heavenly sanctuary okay all right you said yeah. you had another quote for that keep on yeah, there's another quote of looking unto Jesus. Uh, that's a, actually a book written by Uriah Smith. That's a that's a, a follower uh, or a companion of Ellen G. White on page 143, paragraph one. Uh, it's basically restating the same thing. Our sins are transferred to the heavenly sanctuary through the blood of Christ. Hmm. Can I ask? So you the that? heavenly sanctuary is being defiled. Is being contaminated. So basically, heaven. Is being contaminated with Jesus's blood. Okay, so so I can understand because remember, uh, I'm I'm trying to figure this out because I'm not an Seventh Day Adventist. The sins of humanity or believers, whatever, is literally believers. literally transferred to Christ, so that Jesus's blood, the blood of Christ, now. <clears throat> has within that blood all of our sins all of our sins and is in yes. his blood okay yes. and then why is he then taking his blood that's now filled with our sins and <clears throat> doing what with it in the ta tabernacle again what is he doing with it uh, well, well he, he's transferring them into the tabernacle why he's transferring them into the into the holy of holies because I will come later to that point. Okay, uh, I ahead. have uh, also quotes for that because because in Adventism, uh, when you say your sins are forgiven, uh, it actually means that your sins are not forgiven. They're only forgotten and they are stored up. Okay. So he is doing yeah. that in order to store up the sins in the heavenly sanctuary oh, so okay. that the investigative judgment can take place. Okay, so brother, but I'll, I'll, I'll before you go on, don't I'm not trying to be difficult because this is again this is new stuff for us and I want to make sure we're super accurate and people don't get confused and I don't get confused so just so far and you're gonna give quotations to confirm so far what we've understood or if I've understood sins are literally in some tangible real way transferred into the blood of Jesus and then that blood yes. of Jesus that blood of Jesus that now in some tangible way 
is filled with the sins of sinners, is now put in the most holy place, and his blood is there, but all the sins of all these sinners that have turned to Christ are really tangibly in that blood, part of that blood, and that's how he stores it up. So when he puts his blood in the most holy place, his blood is there, storing up all the sins that are now in his blood as part of his blood. Am I understanding so far? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly okay. the way. That's exactly the way she says it. All right. Okay. I'd like to move on to the to the next uh, point, uh, which is which is basically, and this is what she says. This is not this is not an interpretation that Christ is a sacrifice only. He's only the sacrifice. He is. Uh, I'll just read it for you. Uh, okay. He's the he's the so called he's con he's the condition of the atonement. He's not the atonement. He's the condition for the atonement. Okay, but let, let me let me first start with the uh, with the first quote. It says, "But how much is implied in these expressions that he bore our sins on the tree, and that he is the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world? Simply that there a sacrifice was provided, the merit of which was sufficient to avail with God." To cancel the guilt of the entire world. Why? You are shocking us more and more. You even have an ex-Adventist saying you're absolutely right. So he's the condition for the atonement. So he means a sacrifice so that atonement can take place. So, But it didn't exactly. actually take place. He's the condition to make atonement a reality sometime in the future. Is that how one's understanding this? Exactly. Exactly. So he didn't and atone by his death. Pardon me? He didn't atone by his death. His death was no. necessary to make atonement a reality in the future. Yeah. I'm understanding so far? To, to, uh, uh, to postpone atonement. Postpone it. Okay. All right. Okay. To postpone atonement. Okay. So we continue with another quote from Acts of the Apostles, page 29. And uh, it's actually a book that she called, <laughs> she called Acts of the Apostles. And it says, Christ's sacrifice in behalf of man was full and complete. But notice that she, that she says Christ's sacrifice. And it goes on saying, the condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. The condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. And that's the first thing that I said in our previous discussion, Sam, that the wording, she is like a spin doctor. Yeah. She is a false prophetess and a spin doctor. She's like putting these little uh, little ways of, of, of formulating sentences that are really like if you don't read if you don't read, if you don't read attentively, you really might be easily uh, 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 like drawn into this cult. That's very like I mean like like you said, I, I saw the video that you, um, uh, that you that you posted uh, after we had our discussion, uh, saying that you were basically shocked and you couldn't believe it. I mean that that they even made you believe that they are um, uh, that they are Christians and Trinitarians. Yeah, they did. Oh yeah. boy. Okay, so it so it's the condition Christ that he fulfilled, not the atonement the itself. Atonement. Yes. Okay. Good. Right, right. All right. And now let me tell you what what she means when she says that um, uh, let me just yeah. find it here all right i'll just continue with the quote with, an, with another quote that's from great controversy chapter four god was to be manifest in christ reconciling the world unto himself and now she is uh, misquoting second corinthians five nineteen. man had become so degraded by sin that it was impossible for him in himself to come into harmony with him whose nature is purity and goodness. But Christ, after having redeemed men from the condemnation of the law. So that's what Christ did. He redeemed man from the condemnation of the law, could impart divine power to unite with human effort. Thus, by repentance toward God and faith in Christ, the fallen children of Adam might once more become sons of God. 
The so, great controversy, chapter four. Let me. I want to hear that last part again. So Christ redeemed us from the condemnation law, so He could impart yeah. divine power with human effort. To yes, so the, the, so that He can uh, impart divine power, and that we could uh, we could unite this divine power with our human effort. And so you're going to explain in, in what order, that means, right? What it means, human effort, because I suspect from what you've read so far. That what Jesus did was now empowers us because of his death in such a way where we're the ones who are actually contributing and doing the salvation, right? It might, this is this is how I'm seeing it exactly. so far. Yeah, this is where it's going, but I, I, I'm just like going like step by step okay, to give you all. The See, points. my mind is jumping already, <laughs> like a chess player. Step said, "Okay, guys, please let me <laughs> let me just." Let me break down what he said one more time. The death of Christ removed the condemnation law. So now you receive empowerment from Christ, divine empowerment, so that now you can, by your own human efforts, accomplish and achieve something. And that's where he's going. What can you accomplish and achieve? Now go ahead. Keep going. You can, uh, you, you can accomplish uh, uh, basically sinlessness. Mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can become sinless, but I'm going to continue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Later on, I'll come to that point. <clears throat> so, why investigation and what uh, and what it is? Let me let me try to clarify this with uh, with with uh, with uh, Alan G. White's um, um, uh, books. So, I'm quoting now from the Great Controversy, uh, page four hundred and twenty-one. And as a typical cleansing of the earthly was accomplished by the removal of the sins by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly is to be accomplished by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. And this is my focus, basically, that our sins are not forgiven, our sins are recorded. They are, and like I said, the atonement, the atonement uh, has been postponed. But therefore, sin, uh, but, sorry, but therefore, this can be accomplished. There must be an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary, therefore, invo involves a work uh, of investigation, a work of judgment. And before, uh, before we start dismantling this quote, uh, here she says, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement, of Christ's atonement. But what does the atonement look like? That's another thing, you know. They will tell you all these things. Yes, you're saved by faith, but by faith in Christ, uh, meaning that uh, because Jesus lived a sinless life, that's why you also have to live a sinless life. That's what it means to be saved by faith. Uh, when when it says Christ's atonement, it actually means the atonement that uh, the way Christ performs it by putting the sins on Satan and then uh, releasing us um, um, releasing us from uh, from from the sins by sending Satan to a desolate place and no. him him paying the final penalty. Okay, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> because I'm trying to figure out what what in the world these seven day adventists are teaching their followers okay so jesus died and that was the necessary condition to make atonement in the future a reality now he then yes. stores up all our sins in his blood in the most holy place so the sins are there yes as part yes. of his blood in some tangible way some we don't know how yes. sin which is not material or tangible you can touch is now attached to the human blood of jesus it's in the most holy place when you do enough good deeds and then the records are open and your life is examined if you pass the test then those sins that were part of his blood will now be put on satan and that's where you will then receive everlasting life yes but you have to you have to attain basically perfection you have to in this and life, your sins. In this life, what happens if you don't you attain? Have, you 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 are not. Um, uh, you will not uh, be. Uh, uh, how how do you say? Uh, you will not get eternal life if you if you don't uh, uh, attain perfection. If you don't get, gain perfection. So they actually think there are people 
in these fallen sinful bodies that can attain moral perfection before they die? Yes. Wait, yes. wait, wait. Come also, on. Serious? Yes. Seriously. Seriously. Like, serious, there's no <laughs> joke. It's no joke because the other thing is what you... Um, what, what nobody knows, I mean, of course, uh, Adventists and hardcore Adventists know that. And uh, you have to, I mean, I'm talking about traditional Adventism because I grew up in a very traditional Adventist home. We, we were really devout to Ellen White. We tried to follow all those laws. No pork, no Coke, no coffee. That's why I have such white teeth. Gorgeous teeth <laughs> uh, you have. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, we were we were living a very very traditional Adventist life, and uh, you you can find all these things that I'm that I'm that I'm saying. You can find it you can find it in her writings. And actually, what I wanted to say is that sin. Why can we why uh, why can we why why does she think that we can attain sinlessness? Because in Adventism, um, sin is not a condition sin is an action so if you do not commit sin then you are not sinful so it's not like we christians believe that we are in a fallen nature we um uh, uh, we we are in a sinful condition like it, it's in a, in a in a in a state in a sinful state plus uh, sinning is also an action but she only believes that uh, sin is sin is an action. She doesn't believe that actually sin is a is a state and is, is a condition. Sin is an action because her definition of sinning uh, is what she's uh, uh, taking also from the Bible is uh, um, uh, the transgression of, of law. Yeah. But that's how she bases her her interpretation uh, on saying, well, um, um, sinning is just an action. It's not a it's not a condition. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. In other words, <clears throat> it's not so much you can sin in your heart and your mind, it's you obeying the law or breaking the law that's sin. Yes. Okay, but here's uh, the definitely problem. Definitely true, but then, on the, but then in other places, I mean this, this Adventism is so incredibly like it's so full of full of uh, full of deception that in some other places she says or everything that you thought that you did and uh, and that you have written whatever you have done is going to be recorded uh, in this uh, in this book yeah so that that's this it. angel over. is recording yeah it's over because that's what i was going to ask you the question and I, and then again i'm i'm sorry i don't mean to interrupt because remember this is new for us you've been doing this 30 years so it's like we're trying to process this so sin for her is breaking the law by failing to do it or doing things it says not to do but then you just said that she yes. even mentioned god will record your thoughts so in if in my mind i have had an evil thought doesn't that disqualify me it disqualifies you but only if you uh, uh wait it, it disqualifies you if you do not truly repent of it this is impossible if you truly There's repent of it that means Adventists should just give up and live life to, you know, and just because you're going to hell anyway, man. There's, there's no way. Yes, this system you're going to hell. Psychoterror. Yeah, psychoterror. I like that word. This means Adventists who really understand their religion are living in misery, are living in, in perpetual sadness and depression because they realize they'll never be able to attain salvation. So then what's the point? But go ahead. I'll let you keep quoting her. But do what yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, since we just uh, opened this topic of psychoterror, uh, the, the, the other reason why I would not like to be public is because my family are there, are still Adventists. Yes. And I can tell you, like, both of my sisters, they had incredible psychological problems. Like, I don't want to go into detail, but really up to the point where uh, their lives were almost totally destroyed. Like, it's, it's, it's really because... They are still trying to be uh, try try to be good Adventists. They have like paranoia attacks. They have they have depression. Everything like all these things. But this is just uh, this is just uh, uh, just besides. All right. Uh, well, by the way, just to the next brother, point. just let me confirm what you just said. Uh, Dave Balaam says that's why I was depressed as an Adventist. 
that's why I was depressed as an Adventist. Yes. Yes. I, like me too. <laughs> sad, man. Sad. Go ahead, my brother. Continue. I'm sorry. You're just shocking us again, but go ahead. No problem. Um, here's another quote from Patriarchs and Prophets on page 357. Listen to this one. Like, this is, this is unbelievable. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel sin. <laughs> was not to cancel sin. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So, in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Wow. I don't even need to say anything. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Blasphemies, but keep going, my brother. I'm not going to stop you. That, that itself was clear. Um, and this is uh, for everyone, I, I think, for also for all the Adventists, they should just, who are listening, if there are some Adventists listening, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357, where she really says that uh, the blood of Christ was not to cancel sin. <sighs> okay. I'll move on to the next quote. Uh, which is basically, I'm right now, like, reaffirming with a couple of quotes, I'm just reaffirming all those things. Because she's also repeating herself uh, quite often. Mm -hmm. in, in the great day of final award, the dead are to be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. She's misquoting Revelation 20, 12. Mm -hmm. Then... By virtue of the atoning blood of Christ, the sins of all the truly penitent hmm, will truly. be blotted from the books of heaven. Truly, Thus right? the sanction. Yeah, truly, truly. Yeah. And I'll explain later what it means to be truly yeah. penitent and what it means to be a true, real believer. I already saw the setup. When she said truly, that means she's setting you up for some false teaching. But go ahead. The truly penitent? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> then, then by virtue of the atoning blood of Christ, the sins of all the truly penitent will be blotted from the books of heaven. Thus the sanctuary will be freed or cleansed from the record of sin. In the type, this great work of atonement or blotting out of sins was represented by the service of the day of atonement. The cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, which was accomplished by the removal by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, of the sins by which it had been polluted. As in the final atonement, the sins of the truly penitent are to be blotted from the records of heaven. No more to be remembered or come into mind. So in the type, they were born away into the wilderness, forever separated from the congregation. So uh, this quote I'm offering just to, just to lead you uh, to where I'm actually, um, uh, 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 to where I actually want to go, um, uh, the truly penitent. Uh, here's another quote uh, that that uh, that is setting you up for something, like you said, that is coming up. Um, that is from Great Controversy, page 480. And Sam, yes. if you want to find out something, of, or anybody, if you want to find out something about Adventism, read the Great Controversy. It's a, it's like a, it's like a, basically a fight between Jesus and and uh, Satan. Um, uh, that uh, took place in heaven before creation, okay. and this is all made up. Let this me, let me, let me, like, let me, I don't know. Let me repeat that again, guys. The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White's book. It's online. I found it. Do a Google search. You hear what he just said? I didn't even know it because I was just looking for certain quotes about the Trinity. He just told you Ellen G. White came up with a fictional conversation that she says took place. It's fiction. It's a lie. But remember, she's a prophetess. Supposedly, the great controversy, this debate between Jesus and Satan in heaven. That's what the great controversy is. Not only is. a debate. Not only a debate. It was like uh, the, like everything that happened in heaven that uh, Satan rebelled against God. And uh, uh, he was blaming God that he was uh, unfair that uh, because uh, he 
uh, he expected of all of all creation that they bow down to his law and all these things. And actually, uh, I wrote down one one thing that's pretty interesting. She is wait, let me find it. Uh, yeah, here it is. Um, <laughs> in chapter twenty nine, she mentions Satan thirty two times. She men mentions Lucifer twenty times, and she mentions Jesus four times. So oh, it's all about Satan, Satan, Satan did this, Satan did that, Satan, Satan um, was uh, was talking to Jesus, he was doing this, he was like, it's all about Satan, it's all about Satan, she's focused on Satan, so I'm actually wondering um, from where all these Because her father is the devil, came from. her father is the devil, <laughs> what's wrong with you, man? Right? <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to continue. So uh, the Great Controversy, page uh, 480. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period. So this investigative judgment is only for Adventists. What uh, what a what a what what a good news don't you think it's good no. news man it's been bad it's so good far news man it's like we're freed we're super we're freed from sin we're like hey man like like there's hope there's hope there's gonna be an investigative judgment for you i mean give me a break <laughs> and then the judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period okay let me continue the books of record in heaven in which the names and the deeds of men are registered are to determine the decisions of the judgment. So what is to determine the decision Your deeds. of the judgment? Your the deeds. deeds, the deeds, the deeds. Okay. So Adventism basically in short is legalism. It's, 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 yours. it's uh, salvation by works. Uh, there every temptation resisted every evil overcome every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled and every act of sacrifice every suffering and sorrow endured for christ's sake is recorded that's a uh, great controversy page uh, 480 481. Uh, i'm continuing with quoting um that's uh, same book uh, 482 483 Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Every name is mentioned. Every case is closely investigated. Names are accepted. Names are rejected. And this is done about Adventists. Yes. So I want the Adventists who are listening to hear what you just said. Adventists who have failed to show enough repentance, remorse, guilt for their sin, and done enough deeds and sacrifices can be rejected. And so their sin will not be then transferred to Satan. Their sin remains attached to the blood of Christ and it's not removed. Right? Um, no, no. Uh, oh, their sin... Because it's not going to be removed, sin, right, from the most holy place. Their sin, no, 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 no. Their sin is staying basically attached to them. Then they will have to oh. uh, pay for their own sins. Okay, so now it's oh. attached to them, and only those who 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 make it to sinlessness, uh, only the sins of those are being transferred onto Satan, okay. and Satan is paying the final penalty. For but that. what about their sin that was covered? in the blood of jesus when they repented and put in the most holy place that's what i'm referring to i'm not talking about afterwards because not right now if i turn to jesus all my past sins are forgiven those sins are now yes. part of his blood which is in the most holy place yes what, what happens to those sins if i'm cut off well they're being investigated if you truly repented of those sins okay but those are past sins before i came to christ right Yes, yes, it doesn't matter. They're anyway being investigated. Okay, so now let me understand it even better. See, remember, like I said, you've been in this. We're getting it. So now I'm understanding, if I turn to Christ, the sins I committed up to this point are there. But then, from that moment on, I need to show true repentance 
for those sins to be truly blotted out. Because if I don't show true repentance, then even though they were taken away, they'll be reattached to me. Exactly. Wait, wait. They'll be... Okay, I want everyone to get this. I want everyone to understand what you just heard. I become a seven-day Adventist, and I do what they ask. From that moment, I'm 48 years old. All those sins that I committed to the moment I became an Adventist are now attached in some tangible, real way to the blood of Jesus, and that's now in the most holy place. I must now do... Also, also, these sins will be investigated. It will be investigated if you truly repented also of these sins. Of those Not sins. only... Uh, okay. Of those sins that you commit after coming to Adventism, okay. but also of these sins. Okay, so I truly, let's say I truly repented of those sins. Now, from this yes. moment on, I need to live the law perfectly. And then if I'm investigated yes. and I show that I fail, then those sins that were in his blood will be reattached to me and off to hell I go. And they won't be placed on Satan. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Did you guys understood how blasphemous and wicked and evil the system is? That's psychoterror, man. It is. I mean, uh, you praise I Jesus, mean, my God and Savior. I'm not an Adventist, and may He save Adventists. But brother, keep go, keep enlightening us, man, because this is like wow. Yeah, uh, and I'm just quoting Ellen White. I'm not doing. I'm not like uh, adding my opinion or anything. All right, uh, let's continue with Great Controversy, page 483. Um, all who have truly repented of sin. And by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice, <laughs> atoning sacrifice, have had pardoned, have had pardon entered against their names in the books of heaven, as they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ, and their character characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life. Read that citation one more time for me. I want to hear that one more time. All right. Um, I sent it also uh, to you in this document if you want. Um, yeah, I'm going to post uh, it. But I, I want us to hear because yeah. uh, remember, brother, when you read something, you put us in shock mode and then we are stunned. And so we got to hear it again until it becomes reality. You've done this 30 years, so understand. You are shocking the heck out of many of us right now. What we're being told by Ellen G. White in her own words. One more time. Read that. What did she say? All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice have had pardon entered against their names in the books of heaven as they have become partakers of the righteousness of christ and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of god uh -huh. their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life so it's that part right there their character has to be in conformity with the law and if not then that it's means they won't be counted worthy of eternal life Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and this is what I also marked here for myself. Harmony with the law of God. I mean, tell me, please, who is who is in harmony with Impossible. the Ten Commandments? Impossible. This is why I don't know. Uh, you said that your sisters, because of that, su su suffered severe depression and misery because they understood. See, understand what that means, brethren. The human nature. We know ourselves. We understand. We are not able to attain that level of perfection. And when someone claims to be a prophetess and says you must, you put that person in misery and hell and anguish and you destroy them psychologically. You do irreparable psychological emotional damage because we know ourselves. We know yeah. within ourselves we cannot attain that level of perfection. And yet Adventists still follow this movement. They still believe this is the way of salvation? Well, I mean, uh, look, I, I think we human beings, we, we tend to self-righteousness. Uh, that's, that's, that's just my... And, and some people who, who tend to self-righteousness and say, well, I am good because I'm keeping the Sabbath. I am good because I don't eat pork. I am good because I don't drink wine. I am good because I don't drink Coke. I think it, uh, it's, it's this pride that feeds these people. And uh, 
I, I think many, many people fall into the trap because they can live out their own inclination to self-righteousness. That's, uh, I don't know. Like you have to be dishonest with yourself. Yes. That's, yes. that's, uh, delusional. That's, that's what, that's what I think. Yeah. Delusional. Yeah. But, uh, continue my brother. I'm sorry. I just, it's, 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 it's okay. a disturbing religion. It's a disturbing religion. But, yeah. But. Very, very, very disturbing, very subtle. All right. Uh, here's, uh, here's another quote, uh, from uh, great controversy, uh, page uh, 484. Satan, in his efforts to deceive and tempt our race, had thought to frustrate the divine plan in man's creation. But Christ now asks that this plan be carried into effect. <laughs> I mean, he's asking. No, he's asking that this plan may be carried out into effect as, as if man had never fallen. He asks for his people not to not only pardon and justification full and complete but a share in his glory and a seat upon his throne he's asking okay, he's I, asking I, I'm, I'm confused if jesus is supposed to be the second person of the godhead even though we realize now they worship three gods three eternal beings so they're not one god but still he's supposed to be god almighty uncreated according to ellen g white and adventist this last time you said a quotation where I understood you to mean something, and there were people in the comment section who understood differently when you had quoted that Satan, who was next to Christ, wanted to be elevated above Christ. Now, what I understood, and there were others in the comment section saying they understood it differently. Well, I understood because I was thinking they claim to be Trinitarian. So Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. So Satan next to Jesus means that he's below him in rank, the next position then the position right after Jesus is. So it's like if you're first, I'm right next to you, I'm second. Others read it differently. They assume, no, no, it doesn't mean he's next in rank. It means that they are actually side by side, equal in status, and Satan yes. wanted to. So now if they yes. understood it correctly, and I misunderstood, because remember, I'm thinking they're Trinitarian. So when they say, or Ellen G. White says, Satan is next to Jesus. I'm thinking, okay, since she believes Jesus is God Almighty, Satan must be a rank below him. So next to meaning a rank beneath him. But they understood, no, it means that they are side by side and he can be elevated over him. And now you're saying, Jesus has to ask, how does this reconcile with her belief that Jesus is God Almighty? Well, Actually, I, I, I wanted to also ask you if we could, uh, we could do maybe another session on the three angels' messages. Yes, of um, course you because can. this this is also like uh, like a very uh, very complicated topic. Like, uh, if I read Ellen White, and uh, I was living Adventism for thirty years, um, if she says that Jesus Christ is an angel next to satan next like uh like they were actually on the same level the only difference is that supposedly uh, not not supposedly that's that's what i'm assuming um uh, what uh, uh is that is that uh, uh, jesus was an uncreated angel mm. and satan was a created angel <laughs> but okay but, okay uh, but but uh, Jesus was exalted. Jesus was exalted because he uh, he he needed to carry out uh, the, the plan for uh, for the redemption of humankind, and that's why Satan got jealous of him. Okay, now so here's here's he the... once was an, an angel next to Satan. Then he fulfilled the plan. He fulfilled the mission impossible. Now he became uh, exalted, and now he is on the same level. Of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let me ask some probing questions about that. If he's uncreated, do they not believe that Jesus also created everything? That as God, he he they believe Jesus. Je they believe that Jesus created everything. Okay, so now these guys are really out there. No wonder Ellen G. White needs to be exposed. So Jesus is God Almighty, an uncreated angel who created Satan. Though he created Satan, though he is uncreated and infinitely greater than Satan. <laughs> 
In her sick mind, still, Jesus and Satan were of equal status, and Jesus only became higher and only became equal to the Father after he accomplished his, his work. Exactly. How in the world does that make sense? It doesn't. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Continue, my friend. Go ahead. Continue. All right. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, and, uh, there were some people in the comment section. Uh, just a very short digression. Uh, digression. Uh, 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 some people were saying that I'm uh, talking nonsense, that uh, Jesus is uh, uh, the Archangel Michael. And I, I have another quote from, uh, uh, let me just see. Well, that's this a is, fact. Uh, In fact, as you quoted, get your quote. Even Pastor Doug Batchelor shows that Jesus is the Archangel Michael because to them, Michael is not a creature. He is the almighty, uncreated son of God. And Michael is one of his titles. So Anyone who knows Seventh-day Adventism knows that's what they believe. But go ahead, quote. Yeah, yeah. and so, like some people are telling me I'm like talking complete nonsense. And here's a, um, uh, here's a quote. It's uh, from the book Daniel and the Revelation uh, from 1909 uh, uh, by Uriah Smith. That was a companion of Ellen G. White. Who then is Michael and what is his standing up? Michael is called in Jude 9 the archangel. This means the chief angel or the head over the angels. There is but one. Who is he? He is the one whose voice is heard from heaven when the dead are raised. Misquotation of 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And whose voice is heard in connection with that event. No, and whose voice is heard in, in connection with that event? The voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 5.28. Tracing back the evidence with this fact as a basis, we reach the following conclusion. The voice of the Son of God is the voice of the Archangel. The Archangel then is the Son of God, but the Archangel is Michael. Hence, also, Michael is the Son of God. There you go. That's right there, black and white. And this former Adventist is agreeing with you. Sweet one, MCS. He's spot on. See? Notice, folks, those who left the seven-day Adventist cult are saying he's absolutely right. We've studied and we confirm. Those are still Adventists are saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's misunderstanding. See, that's all they can do is attack. They can't refute. But continue. Quote as many citations you want. Let me know when you want to wrap up because I'm going to bring you back on for her false prophecies and the message of the three angels. Now, who are the three angels? One of them is Jesus. The other is Satan. Who's the third? Well, well look, look, look. Look, um, uh, I don't think that you will find it uh, ever. But this is my assumption. I'm just, I'm just making it clear right now. This is my assumption. This is not what, what, uh, what I found in Ellen, uh, Ellen's writings. I last time I quoted to you that Jesus is an angel next to Satan. All right. Yes. So, uh, and here is here is another um, quote that Jesus is the. Uh, is Michael the archangel? So Jesus is an angel, okay. But if uh, if uh, if they uh, if Jesus the uh, the the Father and the Holy Spirit, if they are of the same essence of the same nature, what does this mean? They have to be eternal, almighty, uncreated, infinitely well, greater than every created well, thing, right? Well, according to Adventism, according to Adventism, it means if they are the same nature, and if Jesus was an angel, yes, then God the Father is an angel, yes. and God the Holy Spirit is an angel. Yes, yes, exactly. So, if then, part of Jesus' nature is to be an angel, and that's part of his nature, and he shares the same nature of the Father and the Spirit. That means the Father by nature is an angel, and the Spirit by nature is an angel. Yes, exactly, and the, and uh, they focus very much on this three angels messages. So that's who the three like angels are. Lives. Pardon me. Wait, wait. So I'm who, the the three angels to them is who again? No, no, no. The, the three angels messages is is complicated. Uh, okay. We can do it in a in a yeah, in, yeah. in a, in a But I just wanted to know like to if if you knew the names of the three angels, their identities, if they were, or because I'm just, you got me curious. I'll bring you on for the three messages. But do you know their names, their identities, the three angels? No, she's actually misquoting. Uh, she, she's uh, misquoting Revelation. These three oh. angels in Revelation. So they, they, she thinks there are three angels in Revelation that gave the revelation. Well, I mean, let's. Uh, I can. Uh, I can. I have things written down. I don't want to say okay. anything right now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you got me curious because quotations. let me explain to you why you got me curious. And I don't mean, to, I want you to make sure you've done your homework. 
and we get the citations correct because we don't want to misrepresent. When you say three angels, automatically what ran to my mind, Jesus is one, Satan's the other, there must be a third. But now, when you say three angels of Revelation, I'm thinking she thinks there are only three angels that spoke in Revelation. Anyway, that's where my mind, see, this is how my mind works. That's why I'm bald and I'm confused and I have imaginary friends, Timmy over here. He's my friend, Joey the Couch, because, you know, I have all these conversations in my mind taking place. So I create imaginary friends so we can have dialogues because I'm alone. So forgive me, my friend. Hey, Timmy, we'll talk about the three angels later. And we'll ask Joey for his opinion, all right? But go ahead. Continue. Go ahead. Continue. <laughs> yeah. No, I just make, made, made this conclusion uh, about the three. It, it's just it's, it's just a thought process in my head. Okay. But let me let me continue with 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 uh, with the Adventist facts. Yes. Um, so once again, uh, this the, the last quote, but Christ now asks that this plan be carried out into effect as if man had never fallen. He asks for his people not only pardon and justification, full and complete, but a share in his glory and a seat upon his throne. So he's asking for a seat upon his throne. So he has to ask. Um, okay, good. Yeah, exactly. Then another quote, uh, that's uh, Great Controversy, page 484. So at the investigative judgment, it's going to look like this. Jesus is going to be pleading uh, for the subject, like for, for us to, to, be, uh, uh, to be forgiven, and Satan is going to be accusing us. So like, let's say on one, on one side, there's Jesus, and on the other uh, side is Satan. Um, uh, Jesus is pleading for us. Satan is accusing us. So and this, is the, this is the quote. While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. So that's part of the investigative judgment, how it's going to look wow. like in her mind. Can I bring out the implication? Then, go ahead, finish. Read the other quote because i got to bring out the implication so people understand what these quotes are saying. But go ahead, make your other quote. Uh, the other quote is from the same page. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith and claiming for them forgiveness. So he is claiming forgiveness at the investigative judgment. He's not the one who forgives. He's claiming forgiveness. He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels, saying, I know them by name. I have given them uh, on the palms. I have graven, uh, sorry, I have graven them on the palms of my hands. Yes, which is a citation of Isaiah 49, 16. Now, guys, let me break yeah. down the implication. I, I'm getting what he's saying, what Ellen G. White is saying. Jesus asks the Father, pleads before the Father, like asking the Father to sit on his throne. Now understand what you just read. Jesus, Satan, will be standing before the Father. Jesus will be pleading with the Father. I have them written in the palms of my hand. <clears throat> Forgive them for my sake. And Satan will say, no, they deserve to be condemned because they have failed to perfectly carry out the law. At the end of the day, you know who wins? Whoever is able to live the law perfectly, which means that Jesus' plea before the Father can fail and Satan's accusation can prevail. Let me repeat it again. Jesus' pleading before the Father can fail and Satan's accusation can prevail because Jesus can plead for you all day, all night. At the end of the day, what's going to determine whether Jesus will be heard is if you've been able to live the law perfectly. Am I correct? Correct. So do you guys understand? Correct. Uh, just give me a, a, a second for it to sink in. You understand? The scheme of Ellen G. White. Jesus pleads before the Father. Father, they're written in the palms of my hand. You know, he doesn't remove their sin. He, he pleads pardon for their sin. And Satan says, no, they have failed to live perfectly. They haven't truly repented. You, you cannot remove their sin. They deserve to go to hell. At the end of the day, it all comes down to you. If you have done what the Father demands and living the law perfectly and truly repented, then Jesus' pleas will prevail and Satan's accusation will fail. If you failed, then that means Jesus' pleas will fail and Satan's accusation will prevail over against Jesus' pleas, though he's the Father's equal and supposedly greater than Satan. Exactly. So basically it boils down to your own righteousness and it's not about uh, uh, Christ's righteousness. 
And you tell me this is a true Christian denomination and that these are true Christians. And though they may have some things wrong, they're still our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the height of blasphemy to say that Satan can have equal <clears throat> power in influencing the father's decision <clears throat> that Jesus has. Blasphemy, but oh well, what are you going to do? All right. All right. Uh, let me... Okay, I, I, uh, I have mentioned already this, that angels have uh, registered both the good and the evil. So uh, this is also great controversy, page uh, uh, 486-87. Words once spoken, deeds once done can never be recalled. Angels have registered both the good and the evil. Uh, the mightiest conqueror upon the earth cannot call back the record of even a single day. Our acts, our words, even our most secret motives, all have their weight in deciding our destiny for weal or woe. Though they may be forgotten by us, they will bear their testimony to justify or to condemn. Do you hear what I just said? He just confirmed it by that citation. You see how I analyzed yeah. these statements? He just confirmed it. Your deeds will either bring you woe or will bring you rest. Your deeds will empower Jesus' intercession or nullify the power of the intercession of our God and Savior. Did you hear it? Guys, I'm not reading too much more, in this quote. No, keep reading, brother. Go ahead. Keep it's, reading. It's, it's correct. It's totally correct. And here's another quote that, that, that uh, confirms this. <laughs> this. No, no, no. Really, like, like, really. This is like in, like in, in total um, uh, uh, contradiction with the Bible. How have we used our time, our pen, our voice, our money, our influence? What have we done for Christ in the person of the poor, the afflicted, the orphan, or the widow? God has made us the, de uh, uh, the, the depositaries of his holy word. What have we done with the light and truth given us to make men wise unto salvation? And now, this sentence. No value is attached to a mere profession of faith in Christ. No value is attached to a mere profession in faith in Christ. Only the love which is shown by works is counted genuine. Yeah. You can say you trust in Jesus all day, all night. But if you have not lived in perfect conformity to the law and truly repented, nothing Jesus has done or said will avail you. Because Satan's accusation will triumph. If you fail to do what is required, thereby you, the creature, you, let me bring out the implication. I want it to sink in. I don't know if you guys are understanding it, and I'm, I'm seeing you do. You know, you, the creature, will empower Jesus' intercession to be accepted, or you will weaken and nullify the intercession of the Almighty Son of God, and you will empower Satan over against Jesus' intercession for you. You understand? That's what is exactly is being implied by these statements, though the Seventh-day Adventists won't put it that way. There you go. Yeah. And another fact about the about the investigative judgment is uh, the following. That's Great Controversy, page 491. The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking. All unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. So uh, this uh, investigative judgment is going to take place before the, before the second coming of Christ. All yeah. right. And this is somehow going to happen. Uh, we will somehow be in an unconditional, in, no, not, not, not unconditional, unconscious state. Yeah. We will be unconscious of it. That's what she says. All unconscious yeah. that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. So it's going to take place without us to... even knowing it's taking place. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's... it's, it's <laughs> That's what it means. It's, it's, it's taking crazy. place, the decision, without us knowing it's taking place. Yeah. So exactly. That's what unconscious so, uh, means. That I'm so... not conscious of what's taking place. In this investigative process yeah so to to sum up this uh, section of the investigative judgment sins are forgiven 
in the sense of that they are being stored up in the sanctuary until the Day of Atonement, or how Ellen White calls it, the great day of final award. Basically, everything is being investigated, all our motivations, deeds, deepest secrets, etc. Angels of God are recording everything. We're not saved by faith, uh, as the gospel is uh, saying it, is stating it. Jesus is pleading for salvation. Satan is pleading against. And not even Jesus knows if we will be saved. Wait, hold on. Investigative judgment. Wait, wait. You, that's a direct quote? No, no, no. I'm just summing it up. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Quotes. Remember, so you got us in such a shock. We don't know when you're summing up or it's from her. So that's why. Okay. <laughs> just one more time. He, guys, he's giving you a summation. He's summing up the clear implications. He's not reading it through words. He's just telling you the implication of words. Now, sum it up again one more time because you scared me. I thought I was a quote. I was about to, no, I was no, about no, no, to attack no, no, Timmy no, no, for a minute. That's, 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 that's a summary. Okay. Uh, so uh, sins are not really forgiven. They are forgotten uh, in the sense of, of course, they will tell you it's uh, your sins are forgiven but in the sense of that they're being stored up in the sanctuary um, until the day of atonement or how she calls it the great day of final award. Then basically everything is being investigated. All our motivations, all our deeds, our deepest secrets, everything. Angels are keeping record of everything. We're not saved by faith. As you say, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, before, that no value is attached to a mere proclamation um, of faith in Jesus Christ. Um, then Jesus is pleading for salvation. Satan is pleading against. Yeah. Not even Jesus knows if we will be saved. Investigative judgment does not happen on earth. And humans are somehow in an unconscious state. And investigative judgment is only for Adventists, true believers. Uh, only the sins of the truly penitent are being blotted out from heaven. Only our, our deeds will save us. And when investigative judgment is finished, then Jesus Christ will return. And judgment of the wicked is a separate work. So now this brings up the question because you correctly noted. Guys, notice the implication. Jesus doesn't even know who will be saved because he's got a point. If Jesus is omniscient, then he knows who will be saved, who will not be saved. But the fact that he's pleading before the Father to accept them, and Satan is condemning them with the possibility that some will be condemned means that Jesus' pleading only makes sense if he doesn't know the ultimate outcome of those who believed in him. So I want to ask you a question. Do they believe Jesus is omniscient? They say that they believe it, but they say that when Jesus came, uh, came to earth, he gave up his divinity. Even he on earth, he, he was not God? No, he was not God. On earth, he was just a mere human being. Oh, wow. As an example for us, li lived a sinless life, being an example for us, uh, showing us that we also can live um, a sinless life if we are in contact with the divine power. That's yeah. why, uh, if you remember from the last session, that he could not see through the tomb. He couldn't That's see right. uh, right. if he's going to be resurrected. 100%. See? You get it? Yeah, guys, remember this? Side? Go back and listen to the first interview I did. Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb whether God would accept him and resurrect him. See, now now, now notice notice the blasphemous satanic heresies of Ellen G. White and how her views are similar to Joe's witnesses. Because don't forget, Joe's witnesses and Adventism basically are the fruit of the what they call the Millerite movement. The Millerite. So you see why they're so similar. Because even Joe's witnesses say... Jesus was just a man on earth, no more, no less. So we, you just heard it. Adventists believe, or Ellen G. White believed, and those before her, Jesus was just a man. He was no longer divine while he was on earth. And now notice the further implication. I want to help them understand what you're saying. Further implication. Jesus is pleading before the Father for those who have believed in him and saying accusing them with the potential that those that Jesus pleads for will be condemned to hell, means Jesus can't be all-knowing. Because if he's all-knowing, then he knows who will be saved, who won't. Therefore, why plead for those whom he knows won't be saved? So here again, you see how wickedly evil, satanic Ellen G. White and those before her happen to be. 
blaspheming Jesus, robbing him of his glory, of his deity, putting Satan on equal footing with Jesus, blasphemy from the pit of hell. Ellen G. White is a spiritual whore of the devil. I can't say it any more plainer than that. And just real quickly, Aaron Anderson, instead of barking here, call me on Skype, refute the facts so I can send you on your merry way. Stop barking your lies and ad hominems. If you think he's misrepresenting your sources, call me, put us in our place. You know you won't because you know you'll get exposed and Ellen G. White will be condemned for the daughter of the Satan that she was. All glory to Jesus. Now, brother, if you have more quotes, go ahead. I just wanted to sum up the implication have, of your words. I have, I have. So um, I'll just make it short. Uh, if you want to post it on your blog, um, all these uh, quotations that I sent to you, yes, who I are will. the truly penitent, I'll just take uh, one quote of it. Uh, and I have actually one, two, three, four, five, five quotes. Go ahead. Um, the quote says, it's great controversy, chapter 29. The penalty of the law fell upon him who was equal with God. And man was free to accept the righteousness of Christ. And by a life of penitence and humiliation to triumph as the son of God had triumphed over the, uh, over the power of Satan. Thus, God is just and yet the justifier of all who believe in Jesus. So, uh, so let me let me put, uh, put this in a nutshell. It's like after Jesus paid the penalty of our transgression of our transgressions of the law, humans are free to accept His righteousness by a life of obedience, but but um, by a legalistic life. You know, it's like no, you, you got to live like Jesus and overcome as like the Jesus. Son of God has triumphed. And so Pardon now, me. let me let me understand this so that people can understand before you read the other four quotes. So, Ellen G. White expects us to live like Jesus perfectly and overcome like Jesus because to her, Jesus was just a man on earth, not God. And because he's just a man, that means we too can do it because if Jesus could do it as a man, then we can do it as well. Yes. You understand the implication? Yeah. You understand why she's robbing Jesus of his divinity? If Jesus is God on earth, then... Someone can say, well, he's God. We can't do it. So what did she do? Jesus wasn't God on earth. He was just a man like you and me. He could do it by the power of the Spirit. So can you, because if he was a human being who overcame, you can overcome too like he did and Bingo. you need to. Bingo, 100%. Okay. Bingo, 100%. I mean, uh, here is this, uh, let me see. This is also uh, the, uh, the faith I live by. That's the book uh, from, my, uh, from which I'm quoting, 1958, page uh, 219. We have before us the highest, holiest example. In thought, word, and deed, Jesus was sinless. Perfection marked all that he did. He points us to the path that he trod, saying, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's how they understand this verse. Yeah, so you, you see that, right? So Jesus said, you can carry your cross like I did, and you can be perfect in your thoughts and deeds like I was, and then you can overcome like I did if you walk in my <clears throat> footsteps and follow my example. You see? You, you understand, right? Now it makes sense why she said Jesus is just a man. So you don't use the excuse, well, well, hold on, I'm not God. And she'll say, well, he wasn't God either on earth. Jesus was just a man. What's your excuse? You can do it. Stop making excuses. And Jesus expects you to do it. Blasphemy from the pit of hell. But go ahead, brother. <laughs> exactly. And, and, uh, it's the, uh, here's the, uh, on the same page, uh, in the same book, The Faith I Live By, men and women frame many excuses for their proneness to sin. See? Sin is represented as a necessity, an evil that cannot be overcome. But sin is not a necessity. Christ lived in, in this world from infancy to manhood. And during that time, he met and resisted all the temptations by which man is beset. He is a perfect pattern of childhood, of youth, of manhood. Now, brother, just to confirm, I didn't know these citations. But reading your words, by the grace of God's spirit, I correctly understood her implication. See, Jesus did it. From infancy to, to manhood to death. Don't you dare say sin is a necessity. It's not. It's a choice. 
And like Jesus chose not to sin, you can do it. You see? She, that citation, that's what she just said. You guys catch it? Can continue, my brother. And combine this, combine this with the fact that sin is not a condition. We're not in a sinful condition. We're not in a sinful state. But sin is only an action. Yeah. You know, then it's, it, it, you know, then her, uh, her, um, how can I say, her concept, her concept becomes stronger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes yeah. It's clearly, <laughs> it's clearly she yeah. has to blaspheme Jesus, rob him of his heart because her father's the devil. But she did that deliberately show you are not <clears throat> enslaved to sin. You don't have a sinful inclination that makes it impossible for you not to sin. Just like Jesus was 100% man, that's it. And he was sinless from infancy to his death. You have the power to do it. Stop making excuses, you lazy bums. Follow me in my teachings and you'll be sinless like Jesus and overcome like Jesus. That's what she's teaching. Yeah, exactly. And actually, uh, she also claims at one a point, uh, I, I don't have that quote right now with me, that uh, all who are sinning are actually unfit for heaven. See, there you go. That's 100%. So now, yeah. uh, anyway, brother, if you have more quotes, good. I don't want to, yeah, I think people yeah, I got have, it. I have. Go ahead. I have, I have, um, no, 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 no. Uh, here it is. The life of Christ has shown what humanity can do by being partaker of the divine nature. Yeah. All that Christ received from God, we too may have. There you go. Plain as day. And she's misquoting Second Second Peter 1. Verse 4, where it says we're partakers of the divine nature, escaping, escaping the corruption of this world. Yes, we are called by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus and die to the world and oppose the world and our sinful passions. But that's not a call to becoming absolute sinless in this world. We strive for sinlessness, but know that we're covered by the blood of Jesus and his perfect righteousness avails for our eternal redemption and that's the book of hebrews but we'll talk about that some other time but brother i want you to give your uh, further quotes because i don't want to keep chiming in i want you to be quoting from yeah, the yeah, horse's yeah. mouth yeah and then uh, i'll move on um to uh, uh to another let's say um uh, uh, subdivision yes of 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 the of the investigative judgment which is that satan carries out the sins of heaven Hmm. So Satan is actually atoning for sins. Uh, here is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 358. Since Satan is the originator of sin, the direct instigator of all the sins that caused the death of the Son of God, justice demands that Satan shall suffer the final punishment. Christ's work for the redemption of man and the purification of the universe from sin will be closed by the removal of sin from the heavenly sanctuary and the placing of these sins upon Satan, who will bear the final penalty. See? Yeah. Satan's your savior, not because he chose to be. <laughs> He'll be forced to be your savior, bearing your sins and being punished in hell for your sins. Satan, now guys, here's what's ironic. Jesus didn't remove your sins. Satan does by placing those sins on him and then taking your sins in hell and suffering for you. Not voluntarily, involuntarily. He has no choice. So he is your unwilling savior. Yep, there you go. That's unwilling what it savior. is. That's what it is. That's what it is. Uh, and I have now a couple of more uh, yeah, please. who uh, basically... Who basically uh, uh, confirm the same thing? Yes, if yes, yeah, give us these quotes, and we can wrap it up on this point, and then bring you on for the th angel, message of the three angels, and also on mm -hmm. her false prophecies. But give us as many quotes yes. you think we need to show you're not misquoting that you're quoting in context. Yeah. I have I have a couple of more quotes, uh, and then I have. Uh, I have one final quote, which is not connected to the investigative judgment, um, which is uh, which is also like a, um, and then I and then I'm going to wrap it up. 
Sure. So um, when the when the ministration in the Holy of Holies had been completed and the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord. And in presence of the congregation, the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them on the head of the goats. She's quoting Leviticus 16, yes. 21. Yes, yes. In like manner... When the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan. He will be declared guilty of all the evil he has caused them to commit. And the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to a desolate earth, an uh, uninhabited and dreary wilderness. So does she believe Satan will be on earth or in hell from that quotation the scapegoat is banished to the wilderness in a remote place on earth so is that simply well the thing is you know uh, that's another topic that's okay. another topic we should open up because oh yeah because, because they don't believe hell is forever yeah that's right okay that's uh, fine yeah that's it they, they believe that the millennial uh, kingdom is going to be uh, that we will be a thousand years away from the earth while uh, satan will be left on this uninhabited earth and uh, uh, then uh, 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 God or Jesus, I don't know, uh, really, uh, will recreate that uh, earth for us. And then we will come back and dwell in that place. So, guys, did you hear this? We'll, we'll elaborate in the future session. So the thousand year reign of Christ, believers won't be on earth. Earth will be empty. Only Satan will be here on a thousand years with, his, with our sins attached to him. What a beautiful religion. Are you ready to sign up? But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, uh, I have two more. In the typical service, the high priest, uh, that was, by the way, the great controversy, page 658. Uh, in the typical service of the high priest, having made the atonement for Israel, came forth and blessed the congregation. So Christ, at the close of his work as, as mediator, will appear without sin unto salvation to bless his waiting people with eternal life. As the priest, in removing the sins from the sanctuary, confess them upon the head of the scapegoat so christ will place all these sins upon satan the originator and instigator of sin now you got the it. scapegoat bearing this yes this is now the third citation yeah, you adventist he's not misquoting and they admit it anyway but go ahead yeah um so so satan bearing the guilt of all the sins which he had caused uh, god's people to commit will be for a thousand years conflicted uh, to the earth which will then be be desolate without inhabitation, and he at last su uh, and he will at last suffer the full penalty of sin in the fires that shall destroy all the wicked. Okay, so we got it now. A thousand years, the earth will be empty because we will be in the millennial reign with Christ somewhere else, not on earth. Those thousand years, Satan will be on earth, bearing our sins, miserable and alone, and then afterwards will be sent into hell and wiped out of existence. Okay, we got it now. I understood now what they believe. All right, beautiful man, dude. Yeah. Why'd you leave? This was the truth. What's wrong with you? Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I have to like rethink my uh, decision. Me anyway, too. I have, um, I have. I would before I wrap it up. Before I summarize everything, I would uh, like to read one more thing that is not connected necessarily to the investigative judgment, and this is. Uh, a quote from her early writings on page 55 uh, in the 1882 edition, where she basically says that Jesus has the same physical form as the Father. Listen to this. I saw a throne. So she's now explaining her, uh, uh, her vision. I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus's countenance and admired his lovely person. The father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For, said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. That's a full quote because I want to tell people the implication. That's of a full quote. Okay. Now, guys, That's understand what she just claimed. I don't know if it's sunk in. She's claiming to have a vision. 
like the prophets did, where she saw Jesus appear to her. Because remember, she's a prophetess. Guys, understand what he read. Read that quote one more time. I want it to sink in by the power of the yeah. Spirit. Read it one more time. I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. And what reference was this from what source? Early writings, page 55 in the 1882 edition. Okay, now let me unpack what she's saying. She's claiming like the prophets Isaiah and John, to have been taken into the heavenly presence of God. I saw the throne. She's claiming to have seen Jesus directly and Jesus speaking to her directly and seeing a cloud representing the Father on the throne. She's claiming to be a prophetess on the level of Isaiah who saw the Lord Yahweh, Jehovah in Isaiah 6, and John who in the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit was taken into heaven to see the Father and the Son in visible glory. So now notice the implication. She's a prophetess on their level. That's number one. Number two, I want you to catch how she dishonors Jesus, blasphemes Jesus, robs Jesus of his glory, and shows that he is nowhere near equal to the Father. Notice what she says. She can see Jesus, but she can't see the Father. Because if she's the, she sees the Father, she'll be wiped out of existence. Now, let me bring out the implication of that. That means the Father is so holy and pure. To see him, you'll be wiped out. So what does that mean about Jesus? Jesus isn't as holy and pure, so you can see him. Do you understand the implication? Understand what this wicked daughter of the devil is saying to her followers. So you can see Jesus, and you won't be consumed and wiped out of existence. The Father you cannot see because you'll be wiped out of existence. Why is that? Are you saying the Father is more pure, more righteous, holier, <clears throat> more glorious than the Son? Because if the Son is equal to the Father in glory and majesty, then if you can see the Son, that means the Father can appear visibly for you, for you to see Him. But if you can't see the Father, you shouldn't be able to see the Son because they're equal in glory, in holiness, and purity, and righteousness. But what she said makes Jesus less than the Father, the Father better than the Son, robbing Jesus of his glory, blaspheming him because she's a daughter of the devil. You see? That's the implication. That's, exact, that's, that's exactly. I mean, um, this is like, uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the final quote I wanted to yeah. give you on, t on top of all these uh, uh, quotes that, uh, that, are, that are discussing the investigative judgment. Yes. So that's basically that basically Jesus has has a phys, has the physical form of the Father. Yeah, and yet you can see Jesus, but somehow the Father can't be seen because that's blasphemy. Why is the Father too pure, and Jesus is not as pure? Why can I see Jesus and not the Father, if the Father is a form, and yet Jesus said, "If you see the Father, you'd be wiped out of existence." So then, what does that mean about you, Jesus? That means Jesus is either more loving and ca compassionate because he's willing to be seen. But the Father is so arrogant and proud, he won't let you see him. Or the Father is so holy and righteous, you can't see him, which means Jesus is not as holy and righteous. There's no way of getting around this. Now, for the rest of you, and I want him to wrap up and sum it up, and I'm going to bring him back. I promise, God willing. Read Daniel 7 when you have a chance. Read Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10, and verses 13 to 14. When you get a chance, Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10, verses 13 to 14, and read Revelation chapter 4, the entire chapter, and Revelation chapter 5, the entire chapter, Daniel and John, by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, filled the Holy Spirit, see the Father appear visibly. Though God by nature is formless, each person of the Godhead can appear visibly. The Father appear visibly, the Son appear visibly, and they see both the Father and the Son visibly in visible form. Showing she's a liar and a tool of the devil and a daughter of Satan, a false prophetess. So there you have it. Now, brother, if you want to sum up your points, 
and I will bring yes, you back I, I, maybe I, in two weeks. Yes, I would like to sum it up because it's because actually it's like really a lot, you know. If you that's why when you asked me in the first session like what is Adventism, what do Adventists believe, I was like, oh, I don't know where to start, man. It's everything is. No, I'm going to be it's bringing problem. you back. So, yeah. All right. So here's here's how I would sum it up. Um, in 1844, the judgment of the dead started in the heavenly sanctuary. When Jesus is finished with the dead, he moves on to the living. Christ did not make the atonement for man's sin when he shed his blood on the cross. He was only the sacrifice and the fulfillment to the requirement for the atonement. After Jesus paid the penalty of our transgressions of the law, humans are free to accept his righteousness by a life of legalism or obedience sins are transferred by jesus's blood to the sanctuary thus defiling and contaminating heaven jesus's yeah jesus's blood becomes the medium that contaminates heaven sins are forgotten not really forgiven but forgotten uh, and uh, I'm again uh, forgiven in SDA view in Seventh Day Adventist view means redeemed from the condemnation of the law. Uh, when they say law, then uh, they mean ten commandments. Sins are being stored up in the sanctuary until Day of Atonement, or how Ellen White says, Great Day of Final Award. Basically, everything is being investigated, all our motivations, deeds, deepest secrets, etc., and angels are keeping record of everything. At the great day of reward, Jesus is pleading for salvation. Satan is pleading against. Not even Jesus knows if we will be saved. Hmm. Investigative judgment does not happen on earth, and humans are somehow in an unconscious state. Only the sins of the truly penitent are being blotted out from heaven. Only our deeds will save us. When investigative judgment is finished, then Jesus will return. Judgment of the wicked is a separate work. Jesus is our highest example. Through union with the divine power, we can live a sinless life in thought, word, and deed. There is no excuse for sinning. Jesus lived, the sinless, uh, lived sinlessly, so we can and must too. Christ's righteousness is a proof that we can be righteous too. In the end, it boils down to our own righteousness. And like I said, um, in, Adventist, in Adventist understanding, sin is not a condition, but an act. Um, then the, uh, this is an uh, extra information, what we didn't mention yet, but true Israel, she very often uses the word true Israel. And she actually means by that God's people, meaning Seventh-day Adventists. Are you not so ironic, and brother? Seventh -day. Today, later, I'm going to talk about Israel and the church today, God willing. So it's ironic. So repeat that part again. She believes true Israel are only the Seventh-day Adventists. Only the Seventh-day Adventists are truly uh, are, 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 uh, God's people. Are One second, Israel. brother. Uh, Alexia, and, I'm in live stream. So here, let, let's disrupt the live stream. Let me shut down my live stream so I can give you attention. Is that okay, Alicia? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. I want your attention. He's not important. You're important. Sorry, you're not important, brother. This guy's important. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and ahead. I just have like a couple of more points. Yes. God's people um, are the uh, are only those who are truly penitent, and truly penitent means those uh, who have reached the state of sinlessness, and those are also considered as true believers. Those who don't accept salvation through Jesus, or uh, having not attained sinlessness overall, will suffer for their own sins. Satan will suffer for the sins of believers, and Satan is the co-redeemer. That's basically what's. Uh, that's basically all of those points are in in all those quotations. Exactly, that's implication. So thank you, can guys thank Satan for involuntarily taking <laughs> your sins and saving you. That's implication. It's Satan. So guys, if you want proof, Ellen G. White is a Jezebel, a false prophetess, a spiritual whore of Satan, and Adventism is a satanic cult. From the pit of hell there you have it glory to jesus christ for this brother pray from god knows him by name pray for his family pray for his sisters pray the lord jesus will bless these sessions these are now two sessions with this young man lord willing i'll bring him back maybe in two weeks time because next week i'll probably be busy to do more sessions he's a godsend so pray the lord jesus bless him and pray god will work through him for the glory of jesus and god ladies he's a handsome man and he can sing 
Bosalamio. <laughs> anyway, God willing, it, maybe because next week I'm gonna. I think I have stuff to do. Prepare some materials on the message of the three angels and the false prophet prophecies, so that two weeks yes. from now you'll be back on. Because I'm gonna have you do as many sessions as God puts it on your heart, my brother. Yes. All right. Phenomenal All right. stuff. Thank you, you Sam. For you, no, thank you. And, no, yeah. man, thank you, brother, because you blew us away. Phenomenal stuff. You should see the reaction of the people. Now it's archived. Thank you, man. You're a godsend. So I will we'll bring you back in about two weeks' time, my brother. All right. Thank you, Sam. God Have bless a blessed you. time. And I can't look at you Bye. for too long without melting. <laughs> God bless you, brother. God thank bless you, man. You. Thank you. All right. Let's, okay, guys, uh, just to let you know several things. Lord willing. God willing, I'll be back on today. Some of you, it's going to be late. You'll be asleep. I'm sorry, but this is my schedule. I'll be back on 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, Michigan time. Talking about Israel and the church. So come back. Invite people. An important topic. Israel and the church. Lord Jesus willing. 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. That's Michigan time. Right? So come back, God willing. And Marcy, Lynn, good to see you, sister. Uh, you're still doing hospital work, right? Marcy, Lynn, guys, I want you to pray. Marcy, Lynn, she's a precious sister who loves Jesus Christ. Throughout the COVID-19 outbreak, she's been working tirelessly as a nurse in the hospital, exposing her herself to COVID-19. And I pray that your health is strong. How's your health, Marcy? I pray in Jesus' name. Pray for our sister. Pray the Lord Jesus blesses her, preserves her, gives her perfect health, long life on earth, and passionate love for Jesus Christ. Marcy Lynn met me, again, by the providential leading of God because she had been influenced by Shepherd's Chapel, Pastor Arnold Murray, and a lot of his misinformation. And God was pleased to use me to show her the teaching of scriptures more clearly. Pray for this precious sister. Pray for God's richest blessings upon her life. And then just to correct GH, Jesus did not say no one can see the Father. If you guys are still confused about that issue, I have several sessions on my YouTube channel and articles. Go to my YouTube channel, type in God being seen, seeing God. Jesus did not mean you cannot see the Father at all. I already went in-depth on what he meant and what he did not mean. Please do not repeat that misunderstanding, that misinformation. But guys, pray for me that God will continue to bless me to get healthier, lose more weight, keep my daughters healthy, make us holy unto the Lord Jesus, more in love with Jesus and the provision. I'll be back 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, Michigan time. 6.30 p.m., Israel and the church, Israel's relationship to Jesus Christ and the church's relationship to Jesus Christ. So pray for a powerful anointing. Make sure you invite people to learn this topic. It's going to bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Maranatha, we love you, Lord Jesus. Preserve us for your glory to die in love with you in Jesus' name. Take care. See you later.